All right, we're here on the Bridge Podcast. Today, my guest is John Schneider. John Schneider is a guitarist and he is the founder of Microfest, uh, Microfest Records. Uh, he does the Thursday show on KPFK Global Village and uh, he leads the Grammy Award winning Perch Ensemble. Um, thanks so much for joining me, John. I'm looking forward to talking. Yeah, love to talk to you. Thank you. So um, I, was, I was checking out some of your stuff and you had this Lou Harrison quote about uh, Parch and something along the lines of like, he was very much in his cup. And um, <laughs> I, I generally start these interviews asking about people's coffee habits. Uh, it just gives me a good sort of uh, window into who they are. And so I'm curious, I see, I think you're drinking some tea. Um, well, I am. Yes, I am. But I mean, if you're talking about Harry's cups, those were not filled <laughs> with coffee <laughs> or tea. But yeah, pretty much. That's what that in Harrison's generation in your cups. That's what that meant. So, yeah, gotcha. he drank a lot. So, yeah, green tea for me. Thank you very much. Do you drink coffee at all or is it more? I used more... to. No, that was then. So I far prefer. So, you know, there's many kinds of green teas, right? Mm -hmm. You yep. are looking at a cup of get ready. I hope you're sitting down. Colombian leafy green tea. Yeah, I always thought it was just Japan or China. Oh no, thanks yeah, to you, a local importer. So, are you mostly into green, or do you do oolong as well, or green pretty much all the time at this okay. point? So, okay, there you go. Um, well, now you, you know. know. <laughs> are you aware if Parch drank any coffee? Um, I mean, I know that he was uh, drinking some booze, but uh, did he do coffee at all? He doesn't talk about it very often, ever actually, because I've read most of everything he's written down, right, or even in letters to people, that sort of thing. I don't think coffee ever comes up, so I take it you're a coffee holic. I do enjoy it. Um, I used to be in the coffee world pretty deep, and um, now I'm refocusing on music, uh, you know, get the priorities straight. But... <laughs> do I get to be snarky now and say, oh, you're no longer a barista? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Did uh, I hit it on the head? Yeah, I'm I'm not currently a barista, but I was I was deep in the game, shining lasers through coffee, making spreadsheets, that type of thing. <laughs> lasers, really? I mean, I, I'm I'm saying it to be provocative, I guess, but um, there's a gadget called the refractometer that tells you the, the percentage of dissolved solids in the cup, so you can sort of deduce uh, some expectation of the flavor based on uh, some calculations. Real. Uh, real geeky stuff okay no no that's that's far beyond <laughs> barista hood <laughs> that's serious mm -hmm. um but you know now i'm trying to be serious about music too again so um I, i'm curious though um so you know you're a microtonal guitarist uh, it seems like microtonality is a big thing to you but um i'm curious so like would you say it's more about microtonality or are you more interested in just in tuneness or proportions that type of thing um is microtonality the, the catchy thing, or um, is there something bigger out play? That's that... a good question. It's a good question. It's about musical expression. It's about emotion more than anything else. It's how you color and interpret music. And as you know, I mean, you're a plucker yourself, right? Mm -hmm. um, the frets limit you, and that's why people bend the blues, right? <laughs> because they're not getting the notes that they could have done with their voice. So it's really, a, once I discovered that there were more than 12 notes to the octave, and even if there were only 12 notes to the octave, they didn't have to be in exactly the same place that we inherited, that was just mind-blowing and ear blowing really mm -hmm. because it's like what am i hearing here that's amazing and then i started playing as soon as i could do this and that just opened the doors wide nice um so i mean do you feel like microtonality is about exploring new colors like you know the i think i saw somewhere like the the notes between the keys or like is it sort of more exploratory to you or is it more about like just getting the thing right that we've never been able to really get perfectly in tune all of the above it because okay. you know microtones there there's no i mean microtone is <laughs> it's an inexact term it just means anything that isn't the system we grew up with which is equal tempered 12 notes per octave mm -hmm. and to me because i've played in pure intervals for so many years to me equal temperament is microtonality because it's slightly off what it should be, right? Which is okay. That's sort of flipping the coin in the other direction. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So microtonality uh, depends what kind. 
Um, if you're playing Bach in a, a well temperament or a temperament from that era, you start to see all sorts of shadings and harmonic tensions that make this standard chord progressions come alive, makes them dance in a way that they wouldn't normally. And they change character depending on what key you're in. Mm -hmm. I mean, wow, who knew? <laughs> they knew. We just forgot. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so let's see here. Um, I'm, I guess like part of this also has to do, I guess, like with integer relationships and like the harmonic series having some nice clean uh, numbers to it. And it's interesting that we can you know, really perceive these proportions. Um, so, uh, I mean, are you more interested in, I mean, I guess this is a weird question, but are you interested more in sort of things derived from the harmonic series or, um, I mean, are you interested in like the logarithmic stuff that's, you know, 19 tone temperament? I mean, it sounds like all of the above, but mm -hmm. how do you think about those distinctions? Well, I personally uh, tend to play either pure intonations, just intonations, or, you know, pure ratio tunings, uh, or uh, well temperaments, or, or historical temperaments. So if you start playing, for example, I'm doing an album right now that is, is split between well temperament and uh, mean tone tuning, which is a Renaissance tuning where the thirds are absolutely pure. So there, that's based on the harmonic series. Mm -hmm. But sadly, Historically, in order to get those thirds pure, it, with only using 12 notes per octave, the fifths are flat. So you have to sacrifice one for the other. So is that a temperament, meaning you're distuning or detuning pure intervals, or is it a tuning because you're actually tuning, the thirds are pure, but the fifths are flat. So it's basically known as a temperament, even though the result, we get some pure intervals. How confusing is that? <laughs> yeah, I've, I haven't really heard uh, the distinction between temperaments and tunings. Can you spell that out? Uh, because I feel like I've never really registered what the difference is. Well, well let's take it from your question about um, pure intervals based on the harmonic series. And it is supposed that our particular tuning system arose from first using pure fifths and fourths. If you think about medieval music, those were actually considered dissonances. Mm -hmm. And during that era, thirds and sixths were considered dissonances, which to me, when I first read that music history class, you, you gotta be kidding, and I rushed over my piano. Well, they didn't tell you that they tuned them differently back then. Mm -hmm. Because if you tune a piano with pure fourths and fifths, the thirds are awful. <laughs> They're way, the minor thirds are way too flat, the major thirds are way too sharp. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so that's a tuning. So, so uh, tempering means you take intervals that are pure and then do something to them, make them larger or smaller for whatever your ulterior motive is. Right. Now, in the Renaissance, they shrank the fifths so they could get pure thirds. When we get to uh, the era of Bach, the well temperaments use a combination of pure fifths and tempered, usually usually shrunk fifths, um, for another very special reason. And ironically, even though a lot of the fifths were pure, like a, a, a perfect de a definition of a well temperament is one where you can play in all keys, but the size of the major third changes from key to key. Hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty amazing. I mean, you can't make that stuff up, right? <laughs> Who would ever want to do that? How did that end up happening? It's a long story and there's histories of tuning to talk about it, but the result is extraordinary. And as you know, I've produced and, and uh, recorded quite a few albums in whale temperament. In fact, we've got two Bach albums right now that just came out this year on uh, Microfest Records. A really interesting, different, they're, they're both Bach. They're both on they're both on my guitar, but two different players. Mm -hmm. One is the wonderful New York new new music and uh, and great Bach interpreter Dan Lapel, mm -hmm. and the other is from uh, Mach Gergich, and that's uh, they're two very different styles. But I recorded both of them, so the microphones were exactly the same, the guitar was the same. I mean, it's all my stuff, right? And yet the music came out completely differently because of their personalities. When you start changing things. I mean, Here's another example. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've happened to see Macbeth recently, the the latest version that was, you know, which is uh, featuring Denzel. Uh, Denzel Washington. I Denzel heard great Washington. things. I haven't seen it though. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's Shakespeare, right? 
People have been performing Shakespeare for centuries. There are the words. Okay, let's make the parallel. There are the notes. Here's Bach. There's the well-tempered clavier. Now, an, any actor, every actor, makes Shakespeare his or her own. That's what they do. And of course, uh, people that play the, the violin sonatas and partitas or the cello suites can shade the size of their intervals. Pablo Casals uh, notoriously not mistuned, but retuned his intervals. He called it expressive intonation. Mm. So to be able to do that is a wonderful thing. So to be able to play Bach in that way, you see different colors in the, in the harmonic stresses. A dominant seventh chord in the key of C is not as biting and just begging for resolution as one in F sharp major, for example. Mm. So that just adds the tension. Interesting. Does that help you a little bit? So, Does that yeah. make more sense? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, are you familiar with George Russell's Lydian chromatic concept? No. Um, okay, so I mean, he, he was, you know, uh, sort of one of these people that was putting out uh, music theory ideas that were taken on by like Miles Davis and all, but... Um, right, yeah. Um, and I guess my interpretation of it is that if you continue to stack fifths and once you get up to seven notes and you arrange it linearly, you get a Lydian scale. and so it's kind of like Lydian is supposed to be better than Ionian and it, more vertical stability and this and that. And so for a while, I was kind of a, a Lydian fundamentalist. But then I was watching this little performance that you did with, um, you know, your uh, little triangle graphical neck guitar thing. Yes, um, yeah. The, I guess, modified uh, parch guitar. And you played the open chord and um, it was this like very juicy, rich, resonant A7 chord. And I was like, oh, I've. I've been on the Lydian train this whole time, but like that, that seems to be like the, the, the secret sauce there. <laughs> um, and I think that's because it's derived from the overtone series, but um, it is, is it wrong then to be a Lydian fundamentalist on some level where we're taking poetic license to say wrong or right, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, they're just different for heaven's sake. I mean, <laughs> there are so many different tuning systems. Why? Why should you be forced to choose one over the other? Why not use them all? Most people can't because they can't afford to have dozens of instruments. Mm -hmm. Of course, horn players can use their mouth to do whatever they want, right? I see you happen to have a saxophonist over your head. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a sax player too? I, I'm not just a just a guitar player. I used to play trombone back in the day, but uh, uh, that's that's oh, talk about my tuning. Oh my god. <laughs> So the point is, there, there's no need to nail yourself down to one system. I mean, actors don't nail themselves to one emotion, for heaven's sake. They should be able to do anything, anywhere, at any time. Sure. And the real, I mean, real freedom, intonational freedom, would allow us to do that. The problem is we're, well, as Parch said, the only reason why people think in 12 equal tones per octave is that that's all they've been handed to think in. Mm -hmm. But if you open the door to new possibilities, good heavens, they're there, <laughs> use them. Or not, you don't have to. But you know, can you imagine buying a, <laughs> a box of crayons or, or oil tubes, right? And just, you, sorry, there's no red for you. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean no red? That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Actually, color-wise, Park said something very interesting too. Uh, he used that as an exact, an exact uh, a metaphor for this. He said, a painter, if he wants a certain shade of red, he can get, he can buy red, but he can add a little white, he can add a little yellow, he can do this, and all these things. Uh, if a musician, a pianist, for example, wants a C sharp, he's only got one. <laughs> <laughs> he can't shade it, he can't put it a little, mm -hmm. of course a violin player can, a singer can, uh, even wind instruments can. And part of the, I think my great joy at being able to, to change my notes is that I could never do that with my straight frets unless I did some bending. And of course, bending is kind of slapdash. You, you can't really hit them exactly the same, right. unless your name is Mike Kadurka. <laughs> and I, I know that you've also spoken to Jeffrey Holmes, mm -hmm. and uh, Jeff is, has written a couple of pieces for Michael where he's playing a standard 12 equal tempered guitar, but he hasn't played that, 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 that. And Mike, God bless him, <laughs> talk about bending strings, he could go to a note, bend it, and then play it and hit it right 
on the money. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. But that's, I, that's a whole new generation. People now realize that can be done. Hey, I'd like to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I know that Mike was just here recently recording uh, this album of uh, Bogdanovich, Bogdanovich's music. And I'm curious, uh, did the two of you sort of collaborate on which uh, you know, fretboards to use from his guitars? or Oh, that um, was completely up to uh, him. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. But uh, <laughs> I sort of gave him the microtonal virus because he played <laughs> in my parch band for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. And we started talking about tunings and he started exploring. He borrowed my guitars a lot to do projects at SC and then went off in this whole direction, which is fabulous. So that's no, it's totally up to him in terms of this particular project, which we just finished recording like last week. Mm -hmm. he, he just left town. It was amazing. And I was I was an engineer. Right. I just got the best sound out of his guitar as as I could. And it was all his choices about what it he, he talked to Dushan about it, too. He actually played some of them for him in advance over Zoom to make sure that his interpretations, you know, should I be doing this here? Gosh, don't you wish you could do that with Bach? <laughs> Man, I, I know that Mike is a, an amazing guitarist, but I, I feel like uh, certain people like you and Jeff and Dushan probably have this window beyond what I've seen uh, that I. I'm I'm scared to see. <laughs> I well, want to know how good he is. We have glimpsed many possibilities that people have not yet grasped yet, and that's just <laughs> part, our, part of the joy of our lives. That because we've gone down this path, okay, down this rabbit hole, <laughs> we've had made available to us so many different ways of expressing with our instrument. It's just it's just such a pleasure. Now, um. I know that I said no surprises, but I do have a controversial question for you. And uh, I, you know, when I was speaking to Jeffrey Holmes, I asked him this, and I was very surprised by his answer. But is there anything special about 432 versus 440? No. Okay. That's it's why just I was different. Saying. I was surprised that he had a, a sort of mystical uh, uh, appreciation of it. Yes. Yeah, I know. There, there's a whole scene... <laughs> Yeah, the retune your C, et cetera, et cetera. And there's this, um, good luck. I hope he has a good time. To me, it's just a frequency. <laughs> okay, that's, yeah, that makes sense to me. And uh, mm, I'm glad to hear mm. you say that. But uh, so there's no special healing properties that you're aware of? Not for me. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess another sort of like mystical thing that I'm curious about, um, you know, we're so used to 12 tones and I know that Parch dealt with 43 a lot. Um, and I know that 43 is a prime number and 12 is a composite number. Um, in the sort of realm of microtonal music, is there anything special about uh, sort of like prime divisions of the octave? Oh, well, yes, there is something special about primes because each new prime gives what, what, Parch would call a new identity. Okay. It's a new flavor. Uh, so, for example, if you go through the first 16 harmonics, which is typically how people get started with just intonation because that's what they're used to, um, this the second is just double the first, right? So that's no news there. An A goes right. to an A. But then there's a new number. If you multiply the, the fundamental by three, then you get an octave and a perfect fifth. Ah, a fifth, that's a new flavor. Mm -hmm. Hey, let's get to four. No, that's just another, that's a root, like two octaves higher. You get to five, that's a new flavor. That's the major third. A seventh is a new flavor. A ninth, not so much, because it's actually three times three. That's more related to something else, right, that's, that we've already had. Mm -hmm. So when you get to new primes, typically, it's, it's literally a new color. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, and then keep going. I mean, Lamont Young famously goes up into like the 117th harmonic or the 243rd or something like that, so. Interesting. Okay, I answered that question, but there was another question you asked. It was at the base of that. Do you remember oh, what I it think was? You, I think you answered it. Um, I don't okay. know if there was another. <laughs> um, uh, I'm also sort of curious though, um, you know, like it, with all this fascination with the tones and stuff, um, I feel like, Maybe it gets away from some of the other aspects like rhythm or the formal aspects, but in a way it's also reflecting the same stuff. Like, you know, um, like a four against five polyrhythm is essentially like a major third rhythm, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, absolutely. And Henry Cowell talked about that back in the 1920s with his new uh, 
resources for new music mm -hmm. and made the Rhythmicon a machine that would do that and somehow wanting to, to it's, it's micro macro level, right? Mm -hmm. Because a major third is five against four. And if you go da, 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 or even three, three against two, if you sped that up, that would be a perfect fifth. Mm -hmm. And yet at so is there such a thing as feeling a perfect fifth on a rhythmic level? Well, I guess cosmically, sure, because it's the <laughs> same ratio, it's the same relationship. Mm -hmm. It's just we're not sensitive at that. It's not a pitch level, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was speaking with Neil Haverstick recently, who you know pointed me in your direction, and um, he asked me up front if I was a microtonal musician, and I was sort of like, eh, I just have a guitar. You know, it has fan frets, but like, no, I'm not really a microtonal guitarist, but per se. But um, then midway through, I realized, you know, everything that I do is very like, you know, this polyrhythm. And so it's not in the pitch domain, but it's still sort of the same flavor, mm. maybe, right? Sure, sure. It's all numbers, as a matter of fact. <laughs> so when you start doing seven against six, which, I mean, we, we were talking about Bogdanovich. I mean, Dushan writes that mm -hmm. <laughs> to be done simultaneously by one person. Mm -hmm. Mike Kaderka <laughs> is about the only guy I've ever met that can actually do that. I mean, most people would say, okay, here's five different players. You do four, you do three, you do two, and everyone's in their little groove and they can do it. But for one human to do that at the same time, mm -hmm. it's starting to crack uh, the, the capabilities of, of our amazing brain, which we evidently only use a very small percentage. <laughs> do you feel like um, some of the people that are claiming to do this stuff, like some of these polyrhythms, like I, I feel like in a lot of classical music there will be extremely complicated stuff and like i've seen people you know try to play to a click track and uh so I, i'm wondering do you think that there's some fake faking going on anywhere in this realm well there can be oh my god if you look at some of the mid-century the, the 20th century complexity where people have seven against six against nine some or it's 13 against mm -hmm. it's just just insane um not fakery, it's, it's attempting. I mean, Berio, uh, Luciano Berio famously said that I like to make music that where people are just falling apart trying to do it, <laughs> where it's the stress and the reaching for it is part of the expression. So I personally, as a composer, don't like to do that to people. And I personally, as a performer, really find those frustrating as hell. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. It's, it's difficult. You know, why be difficult? There's, you know, there's all sorts of reasons. Complexity. Mm -hmm. I mean, Brian Fernie House music is just, oh, takes your breath away. Is it worth all the work it takes to do that? I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. Just because uh, when I was coming up, that was the hip thing. So the the complexity of of uh, even uh, Stockhausen or Abula's, and then the next, then there was the new complexity. Mm -hmm. we, uh, <laughs> a new generation thought that was a great thing, and to me, it's boring. Mm -hmm. It's so abstract and so up there. It's like it doesn't touch me. It, it, so after years of thinking, you know, it's my problem. And I'm like, no, no. It's the music's problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is not working. And, you know, people have voted with their feet for many years. So, you know, I, you hear all sorts of things. Even today, Schoenberg is more respected than loved. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's because of what he did with harmony. People want that. So it's a big question. Do you have to do one thing or the other? No, of course not. I mean, humans have choices. And if that's what floats your boat, go for it. I'm not going to sit through a half an hour of that listening to it. Life is too short. <laughs> mm -hmm. In terms of a uh, boat floating, I'm curious if uh, somebody like Conlon Nankaro does anything for you as a listener. Well, some of his pieces, absolutely. Uh, and some of it, just the sheer brilliance of it and the, the complexity that I know is authentic. And I know it's right mm -hmm. on just because my history tells me how he did it. <laughs> yeah. So I know it's, it's right on the money. And yet it's it's a texture. It's mm -hmm. a cool thing. And you know, you're almost reaching the level of, of, of Cajun uh, freedom and, and chance operations at some point, mm -hmm. even though things are completely worked out. But I mean, it's thrilling. But uh, again, it, in terms of musical perception and emotions, 
it's a texture that should and could be used when or however you need to. Mm. Whether you want to listen to an hour of that is a whole other story. I feel like uh, the people that I've shared Nankara with, a lot of them are just immediately turned off by the fact that it's like sort of mechanical. Mm. Or like that, the execution of it isn't human. And so I'm curious if that is something that affects your sort of aesthetic at all, like uh, whether it's a human that executes something that's very complicated or um, you know, something else like a computer. Well, ironically, what, what I, the fact that Nankar's music, when played the way it was meant to be played and heard, it's still on an acoustic instrument. If I hear mm -hmm. that True. same stuff done on a computer or a synthesizer, I'm totally turned off. And yet, non Carlos, because, because of the, what can I say, the, the inevitable inaccuracy of the tuning or the acoustics or strings, you know, pianos are imperfect instruments. And even sure, they're an equal temperament. I mean, Jim Tenney even did a, a wonderful uh, overtone series piece for, for a, um, a retuned piano that was done with a, a non car kind of, of piano roll, right? And that was also interesting because it was an acoustic instrument. I mean, I'm going to veer off to the left a little bit here because this is completely related. Uh, the fact is that most of the microtonal music that is made today is electronic mm -hmm. because they can do it. Right. I mean, the terrifying thing is if you want to have 19 or 23 notes per octave, that's a really expensive thing to do. But yeah. if you can cook it up using Logic Pro, you know, Logic 10, or any number of synthesizers, great, it's right there at your fingertips. You don't have to spend hours, years, money, cuts, bruises, right. you know, band-aids, sawdust, strings, things like that. It's like an expensive hobby to explore <laughs> something. Now, this also leads me back to Harry Parch's music because, I mean, people all, when they come to our shows, they go, God, this stuff is really weird, it's really neat. These, these instruments are cool. Why'd you do this? Because the music is so damn good. Mm -hmm. That's why. It's not just because it's weird. I mean, I wouldn't have spent the, I can't even tell you how much money and time to create that orchestra mm -hmm. if it was just kind of a cool thing. No, it's to be able to actually, you know, you fall in love with Bach, you want to play that music, you're cool. You can play it on a piano, on a harpsichord, on a guitar, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. if, can you imagine a world where you fell in love with uh, a, a Mozart sonata, but, oh, sorry, uh, the music is very hard to read and it's done in this weird kind of tablature and you're going to have to build your own instrument to do it. You'd run in the other direction. You'd say, oh, I'm out. Yeah, totally. <laughs> but, you know, Parcher's music for me has been so powerful and so strong and so so good that once I started, I just couldn't stop and I still can't. I'm, still, you know, what do I do hours a day, even now, all these years later? It's just, it's just so satisfying to play. Yeah, I, I love that you described it as like literally lusting over the music um, in one of these videos I saw. Yeah, 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 it's true. I mean, it's it's the sort of thing I realized when I was someone who was interviewing me. It just came out like because that's what it is. I mean, mm -hmm. you just you have to you have to. Um, what what can I say? I mean, I'm starting to dance around all sorts of political terms, but you you want to captivate. You want to own. Mm -hmm. this music you want to be part of it you want to touch it you want to taste it you want to feel it that's that's what lust is all about i mean without the obvious connections to you know to human sexual lust but i mean it's <laughs> it is it's a very it's a physical yearning so may we all be that much in love with music right mm -hmm. um <laughs> i mean yeah it seems like parch is such a, a fascinating character and like i love that there's like this visual element that goes into it the pageantry um, you know, it's like a very immersive experience. And like you described it as like the first time that you had ever laughed at classical music. Um, so what, what, what is the humor in this? And besides just kind of the, the absurdity and otherworldliness of it. Oh, um, no, it's, it's real humor. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he, the piece that really got me going way, way, way back when is this piece called Barstow, which are hitchhiker inscriptions. And they're just downright funny. <laughs> and you know people who can tell a funny story and it absolutely falls flat. Or it's like people trying to tell jokes and they, mm -hmm. they just don't know how to. But with the right timing, 
you can break up anybody. So, and it's very hard. I mean, ask, uh, you know, Peter Shickley, right? <laughs> it's hard to write musical humor, but Parch did it. Just the way he, he the, the words themselves were entertaining or funny or ironic, and the music that he wrote to go with it just suited it perfectly. And he presented, I mean, his comic timing is just right on the money. Because, you know, serious music is serious. Right. Well, hang on, his music is seriously conceived, but it's also fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, you described it as kind of the fountainhead of American music. And um, I guess like, you know, I, having talked to Neil just recently and like seeing that he's a applying this microtonal stuff to the blues instead of, you know, like blee blue blop music, um, mm. I, it seems sort of in line with that. Um, I mean, I don't know what my question is, but uh, I guess I'm just sort of curious to hear about um, the like American aspects of like, you know, uh, farmers or like the songs that he was taking from his travels um, and sort of putting into, you know, performance context. Well, I think what really happened, uh, Parch is an interesting character because he actually was played lots of musical instruments when he was young. He even made his living for a while accompanying silent movies. He moved to Southern California to go to SC to become a piano virtuoso and play concertos. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the direction he was heading in. But then he also had this, you know, compositional side to him. And after a while, he just said, no, no, this is not it. And what, what he came to was basic elements going down to basic principles of what music is all about. And he suggested that the, the ultimate instrument is the human voice. Mm. And he needed to somehow find a language that would accurately reflect the human voice. He hated bel canto style uh, because it was fake. Mm. So for him, uh, the, the, the most real music would be most realistically reflect what a human expression is all about. So, you know, you were asking way back when about 43 notes per octave. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he stopped, he used that as an arbitrary number. He often wrote music with as many as 50 or 60 notes per octave because wherever he was, he needed a particular relationship. He would just grab whatever that was. But initially, his first a musical instrument was, um, I mean, he, he wrote a piano concerto, he wrote a string quartet, he burned them all. He said, I, <laughs> I was going down the wrong path. Mm -hmm. I need this new path that uses the same expression that we are capable of as, as speaking humans. And he made this thing called an adapted viola, which uh, was tuned to his voice. It's, uh, it's a viola body with a cello neck and strings tuned an octave below a violin. So the low G is pretty much where his voice sat, and he would take poetry. His first pieces were these uh, these Chinese poems by Li Po or Li Bai, as the Chinese call him, and he would speak them and then grab the exact contour of his voice. And he realized because you know he was trained on a piano, he couldn't find those notes on the piano and suggested that we need instruments that follow the voice. We don't need voices to follow the instruments we already have. And that's where his whole micrototal thing came. And then just because of his own, his personality and the history of being the, you know, the 1930s, he was out of work a lot of time, even though he was this, this explorer, um, he was, he was an explorer in life as well as in music. And he spent a lot of time just working around, you know, he picked fruit for a living, just, you know, working with his hands. And he realized that the music in everyone's voices around him, that's what was real. Everything else was just kind of fake. Let's get down to real, real people doing real things. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, um, uh, well, we talk about his Americana period, those pieces from basically from the 40s, because the, the first, what should we call them, his song cycles, those 17 lyrics of Li Po, th that was art music in the sense that it was high class literature and it was meant to be performed in a particular way, but using the microtones of human expression. 
And then he went on the road and did all sorts of things and realized while he was picking potatoes and, you know, working with people in the fields that this is this music of their voices is just as important as anything else that you could write. And that's when he started to to harvest those those sounds as early as the 1930s. He actually wrote a, a what should we call it? An autobiography called Bitter Music okay. and wrote down what he heard in the fields. And then whenever he could get down to a piano, he would write it down, basically. I've actually recorded this entire, I think it's a three CD <laughs> um, thing with with musical, uh, with one or two of his musical instruments too. And he basically wrote down the contours on the piano of people's vocal lines. So that was the first part of his Americana experience. Then uh, he famously, got stuck in Barstow and wrote down graffiti, right, on the on the highway railing, and he turned those into eight songs. He also, in 1941, at the end of 1941, left the West Coast and moved to Chicago. And he rode the rails, he hitchhiked, and wrote down everything he heard and turned that into music, too. So those were American voices with American... Uh, pronunciations and uh, vocal lines and contours. That was his his Americana period. He then moved on in the in the late 1940s. He started to go in another direction. He built more musical uh, instruments and got interested in theater. In 1950, he wrote his first opera. But his opera wasn't by old Canto. Right. <laughs> uh, it was based on uh, on King Oedipus. And in particular, it was based on the version that uh, W.B. Yeats had written. He actually, way, way back in the 1935, visited Yeats in Ireland and wrote down the contour of Yeats speaking the dramatic lines and turned those into, and way later in 1951, he turned that into an opera. Interesting. So you see, no, it's not Americana, but the concept that he had way back in the 30s, he then applied to larger, larger forms. He then got interested in theater and the whole middle period, all these amazingly, and dance and drama at the same time. So, so what happened really it was the human voice. It just happened to be American because he was American. And that's where he was. Uh, <laughs> that's where he was traveling. Interesting. OK. Um... So I also heard that you mentioned uh, sort of like the fundamental was generally a G. And um, was that having to do with sort of his own vocal register? That, uh, that That's became... exactly what it is. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I was yeah. wondering, like, I, I was Googling what the hertz are for G, and I was like, 392, like, <laughs> um, okay, interesting. 196, the next talk, yeah, all that stuff. And it, it was just his voice. That's all it is, too. And there's no, no magic to it. It's just what worked. People used to joke that made fun of his music. Oh, all his music in the key of G. Well, of course, it isn't at all. That was just the center of his, what he called his monophonic fabric. So interesting. And, and for those specify... of you who, we should say, you know, there's a book about this whole thing. It's called Genesis of a Music. The, the parts were actually, are you kidding me? I never have one very far out of reach. Right? <laughs> it's right here. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. In college, I went as far as to get the Hemholtz book out of the library and sort of pour through it, but uh, I, I should read Genesis of the Music. Uh, they're related because <laughs> Harry found Helmholtz before he wrote his book, of course. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Um, so let's see here. What else do I have? Um, I guess um, something I'm curious about, you know, uh, with the modified parched guitar that you're playing um and these Li Po uh poems and you know I know that you have your listening to uh Lutsu piece um I'm, I'm sort of struck by how much Taoism comes up for guitarists and like microtonalists and that sort of realm of uh musicians and so is that a pattern that you've noticed at all uh where else I mean where like uh, like I Ching and uh John Cage and I mean okay. not that he's a guitarist or a microtonalist but 
Um, uh, Duchamp well, actually, John Cage was a, a, a microtonalist at the end of his life. And I Ching, that's a, that's a whole other, it's, it's not necessarily Taoist. I mean, it was more Confucian, but then you're going to get into, you know, too many, right. too many descriptions. Um, I think it's a coincidence. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to treat it as some sort of a uh, pattern that I'm observing and uh, <laughs> but no um okay well, let's see here um so uh also like I was very in intrigued by the sort of extra hip vibrato that you mentioned uh like the blood vibrato if you will on <laughs> can you talk about that a little bit that was intriguing <sighs> Oof. Yeah, uh, it just so happens that uh, we were talking about Confucius a second ago. So one of the hippest instruments in history is, and this is, there's many ways to spell it, pronounce it, et cetera, et cetera. It's the ancient Chinese qin or qin or gu qin. Or, it's a seven string. Uh, basically, if you know what a koto looks like, there's a long soundboard with strings that go uh, that are attached to both ends usually they're silk strings traditionally in this ancient chinese instrument um, the koto has little bridges that you can lift up and you pluck one side of the string and you can hit the other side and make it to do vibrato the chin had no bridges it's, it was seven silk strings with markers on it where the harmonics were Okay. And you could you could play it uh, all sorts of ways. You could use the back of your fingernails. You would pluck with the right hand and and do do all sorts of stuff. And evidently, there were many different colors, timbres you could make with this instrument. Vibrato, as we know, is the slow or fast or you know is the the periodic change of of uh, of pitch. So a vibrato, and you can. You can determine how wide it goes and how quickly it goes, that sort of thing. So by wiggling your finger, I mean, guitarists know about this, right? Mm -hmm. And you can do it very slowly. Well, the Chinese uh, consider this instrument a very spiritual instrument. This is where someone, uh, a Confucian, may go up into the mountains and just play by himself, just listening, just meditating on the sounds of the instrument. And there, there are many different kinds of vibrato you could do by pushing and pulling the string. But the, yeah, as you mentioned, the hippest vibrato of all is pressing the finger down on the string. What's making it change? Are you pushing and pulling the finger? No, no, it's the blood running through your fingertip. That's what changes the pitch. Okay, that's a little imaginary, right? But okay. they wrote about it, right? And it's almost, it's almost like a Zen koan, right? <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Well, what's the sound of one hand clapping? <laughs> what is the sound of the blood running through your fingertip while it's touching a string? Is it supposed to open up new areas of awareness? Who knows? But it's literally written in the ancient Chinese texts as okay. one of the vibrati. <laughs> so is it more just a poetic notion than like if you were to do that? On... Oh, sure. Okay. Sure. <laughs> sure. I mean, try it. Tell me, can you hear a difference? <laughs> Well, I mean, it's funny, you know, like, uh, like they have these sensors these days, uh, you know, and you can get like phone apps that are supposed to measure heart rate variability by putting your finger over the camera and oh, stuff like sure, that. Oh, sure, sure. So, um, who knows? <laughs> yeah, maybe they were ahead of their time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's see here. It's funny, um, compared to my usual guests, I feel like you have a lot more information per second of talking and I'm, I'm uh, not prepared for it. Uh, <laughs> So um, let's see here. Um, I guess I'm curious about some of the stuff with like uh, Global Village and broadcasting and just like, uh, so you've been doing that for a while now, right? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, I've actually been on the radio since the 1970s, way, way, way back. Um, I used to have three programs on KPFK. Uh, they were all noon concerts, one on Monday, one on Wednesday, and one on Friday. Monday was uh, music of, geez, I'm not, I can't even remember, uh, music of the Americas. So that covered North and South America, and it could have been new music or traditional. Wednesday was called Jazz at Noon, and Friday was called Soundboard, the Art of the Plucked String. It just so happened I was also president of the Guitar Foundation of the America at the time, mm -hmm. and I, and their their quarterly journal was called Soundboard, and I thought that would be a nice way to sort of bring things together. And it was basically a guitar show, but it kept getting, uh, and and then eventually uh, the other two shows stopped, and I just did Soundboard 
till way up into the 1990s. But as I got more interested in tunings and things, that's when it became more than guitar. It was art of the pluck string, harpsichords, harps, the dozens of different kinds of lutes and ouds and long necked lutes that exist. And I got became more and more interested in what is now known as world music, especially because because of the tunings, basically. I loved it. And then in 1997, I think it is, uh, there was a change in, um, in leadership at KPFK, a new program director. And we thought, hey, let's do something called the Global Village, where we just cover world music and we'll have a different host on every day of the week. It was originally three hours a day, not two hours. And each person brought their own specialty. There was a, a, a wonderful Persian woman, an Iranian woman, uh, named Yatrika Sharaiz in the original group. There was a, a, a folky named Tom Nixon. Uh, Beto Artikos, who is, uh, just knows more about Latin music than anybody. Um, and I was the guy who basically did the classic musics of the world, plus jazz and that sort of thing. And that was where the Global Village started. Interesting. Um, in terms of curating, I mean, like, I'm sure that you have, like, a, a huge wealth of stuff to curate from. Um, how do you go about making those types of decisions? Funny you should mention that. <laughs> it's Wednesday night, and I have a show tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Is it in the moment curation, or... Uh, I, I, I would it all depends. Oh, yeah. I mean, again, I've been doing it for over four decades, so it's, it's very different every time. Um, I, well... In the before times, we used to have a lot of live performances, right? Uh, groups uh, as large as 10, 15 people. Play. We even had a, a guitar orchestra come over from Germany and play in Studio A. I mean, there were there were 40 guitarists in this wow. one two-story room. I mean, it's just, it's just wonderful. So uh, I've often had a lot of live music. And again, when we had, I mean, the Yo-Yo Ma and the Silk Road Ensemble came and played for us, that sort of stuff. Um, and whenever artists would come through town, we'd try to grab hold of them and say, hey, you want to come play in the air? You know, promote your latest whatever. So um, it can be either live music. It can be a series of releases, something that's come out. If something uh, extraordinary happens, uh, you know, Grammy season, I do nominees, that sort of thing. It's just, it's all over the map, basically. <laughs> it's whatever, I mean, to be brutally honest it's whatever i'm listening to at the time whatever i think is really cool but i also don't want to inflict my my pretty <laughs> unusual tastes on on people all the time so I, I love to mix it up and the reason why i brought back that that earlier concept that i was doing three shows because it was it was contemporary music it was jazz and it was uh, pluck string music i mix all those elements into global village now and it can be an 80 style, any instrument, but I, I like to do present unusual music to say the least, and also sneak in some microtones. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> um, I guess like, what are your listening practices these days? Cause I ask a lot of people this and I feel like it's a very general question, but it's an under asked question. I think uh, just like, you know, are people listening carefully? Are they listening carelessly? Are they, you know, listening to hours a day, or are they listening to like very little? Um, how would you describe your listening? Boy, it's changed over the years. Uh, I used to, uh, I was a music professor for many years and I would have to drive a half an hour to get to my job. And I did a lot of my listening there. I mean, mm -hmm. when, uh, when cars had CD players in them, <laughs> I would be listening, you know, cause I, I, to this day, I get, so many CDs in the mail, you know, at the radio station. So I have to do a lot of, a lot of auditioning and things. of what do I think is worth, worth sharing? And I'll, you know, people send me an album. I'll, I'll listen to the whole thing. It, if it's worthwhile, mind you, I can usually tell in the first three cuts exactly what's going to happen, having heard a lot of them. So um, sometimes I listen, I'm usually listening, I'm shopping for something for the, the next week's radio. Uh, I get a lot of things uh, in the mail where I think, wow, I've never heard that before. I'd love to know what, what is this person doing? So there, there's exploration, but there's no, there's no style I'm chasing necessarily. I'm just intrigued with what people are doing and what's, what's good and what isn't. Mm -hmm. And what I like to do, of course, is, uh, you know, 
the wheat from the chaff, try to bring the best of the best to the radio show and share what I've learned during the week or the month and uh, what little jewels I've discovered. And that's that's basically what, what I do on the program, whether it's live or or nowadays you can even, heaven forbid, you can use things like YouTube. <laughs> and I say that just because the quality of the sound. I mean, MP3s, Mm-hmm. As a recording engineer, I shudder at MP3s, right? Because <laughs> I record all my stuff in high resolution. And yet, you know, everyone has different playback systems, right? Let alone earbuds. I mean, those are not high frequency machines. And yet, they bring a lot of pleasure. So, you know, <laughs> you got to use what you got. It's funny. Um, I was doing a project for a friend of my dad, and he needs everything in MP3s. And I think it's just because he doesn't really know how to handle various you know files being sent over the internet but Mm -hmm. um in the process of doing this i think that they were in a moment of distress they went as far as to record something into garage band from an mp3 into their own speakers or something like that so like by the time i got out into the world it was not mangled beyond description (laughs) so i i appreciate your sentiment about uh mp3s um it you know again uh you know i mentioned this to you in our email correspondence but uh the sound that you're you know, putting forth on a lot of this stuff is just utterly clear. Like it, it was shocking to me. And so I'm curious if you can uh, shed some light on that. <laughs> uh, just are, are you referring guitars? to the guitar albums that just came mm-hmm. out? Is it... yeah. yeah. I mean, I learned how to become a recording engineer because after working with many engineers, I realized by the time I got back listening to what they were recording, that's, that's not what I was hearing. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, um, my concept of recording is is sort of I used to call them UCAP up close and personal, <laughs> where details are important. Mm-hmm. And for me as a player, I'm right there. I mean, the box is there. What I can hear is not what somebody hears in the tenth row, let alone the fortieth row, in mm-hmm. uh, in a large hall. So I want to give atmosphere, of course, but I want to get. I really want to get detail. And it turns out that just a stereo pair of microphones doesn't really give you the full experience. I mean, even this thing known as binary um, recording or dummy head recording, where you actually put microphone capsules where the ear would be. And, mm-hmm. you know, this this wonderful invention from, from years, from decades ago, where you get a, literally a plastic or a, a foam head and put microphones, and there's, there's fake ears on there. You can mm-hmm. actually get a perfect sense of locality of where everything is coming from. Because as you know, when you hear something, you're not just hearing it coming at you, you're hearing also all the reflections and all these amazing things. Mm -hmm. It's a very complex psychoacoustical phenomena. So what I try to do is bring that same complexity to two channels somehow. And by using a a series of microphones simultaneously, uh, never fewer than four, sometimes as many as six or eight, uh, their placement and their relationship and the balance between them, that's that's what I'm getting. That's that's what I'm wanting to get. And evidently, you've noticed. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it, it was shocking. And I was just like, oh, shit. <laughs> but, so, um, interesting. Uh, in terms of like psychoacoustical phenomena, um, I mean, how, how geeky do you get about this type of stuff? Um, or is it more like... Uh, kind of a a felt thing or like are you pouring through textbooks to like understand all the not pouring through textbooks but you have to remember i actually have a doctorate in physics and music and i spent three years in a psychoacoustics lab in in britain and it was an intriguing experience because uh, i was doing my own research Uh, my own research was in uh, why and how you can change the color of of notes by changing where your right hand moves Mm -hmm. what is timbre that sort of thing so i was working on that project but in the meantime my other office mates were working on other projects and i was a guinea pig in their experiments so I got to learn a lot about psychoacoustics, about how we perceive pitch, how we perceive uh, the location of sources, all that sort of stuff. And then having done all that work, I now use my ears. Gotcha. <laughs> so I've gone through that door and it's become just the way 
it's 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 part of how I think, if that makes sense. Totally, yeah, interesting. Um, I, I didn't know about your uh, doctorate in uh, you know physics of music. Uh, that's... Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, interesting. Uh, Hmm. Uh, so in terms of like that type of research these days, is there any sort of, or are there open questions that you would personally like to see researched or, um, I mean, like in my mind, acoustics have been solved, but I'm, I'm just a, just hmm. a, a guitarist, but, uh, I have no idea. Just a guitarist, please. <laughs> to be a guitarist is a big enough challenge in and of itself. Um, there are many things that are being explored now, as you well know, with all these new sound reproduction uh, technologies coming out, including multiple speakers and messing around artificially with phase relationships in order to create a more realistic situation. Uh, there's so much work to be done. We still are not completely sure on how the ear works, for heaven's sake. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that there's a lot to be done. But again, um, I'm... I've left the academy, I've finished my research work, and now what I'm trying to do is use the information and the tools I have at hand to create the most musically expressive uh, and emotionally cogent colors and re-representation of the real live experience of listening to music, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think so. That's what I want to do, so. Gotcha. In other um, words, I'm I'm not going to go into a lab and do that sort of stuff anymore. I've just been there, done that. That's for people uh, to do something else. I am at, at a certain age where it's producing things that are important, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's I think that's the best work I can do is by writing music and by reproducing music through recordings in such a way that I feel the most uh, truthfully represent what's what's happening. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, uh, so with, you know, people like Michael Kadurka, obviously they're just playing, uh, is, you know, not going to include mistakes, but, uh, I feel like there's some desire to like capture that authenticity of performance. And so like, I'm assuming that what you're doing doesn't really have any like sneaky stuff going on, right? You just have excellent musicians and they don't make mistakes, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I have a special filter. I call it a clam filter, right? It, it automatically takes all the mistakes. Of course they make mistakes, for heaven's sake. I mean, um, probably the most important musician for me growing up was Glenn Gould. Okay. Partly because he taught me so much about articulation. And I've tried to, as a player, make transfer that over to to the guitar. But he also... His concept, you know, his famous story where he stopped performing, right? And he focused completely on recording. And his recordings are just absolutely magical. And, I mean, recently, uh, a couple of years ago, actually, uh, they released all the takes of his world-famous 1955, was it? The, the Goldberg Variations. And you can hear all the mistakes he made and you know you know his the recordings that we know and love are basically made out of splicing tape <laughs> with a lot of recording tape in between i mean um he manufactured an experience and ironically the next generation of players heard that and say oh that can be done and they actually learned to play that well <laughs> yes which is right. insane. It's it's amazing. So, for example, we just finished this beautiful recording with Mike Kadurka, and we did lots of takes. And sometimes one moment just didn't quite run into the other. So, the way I feel, uh, I could spend the rest of my life going to house to house to house and playing for people. <laughs> and this is the way I think this should go. But obviously that's not going to happen. We're blessed with the technology to be able to send recordings out in the world. Mm -hmm. And think a, a, a composer really wants, I think, I as a composer certainly do, I want a, an appropriate representation of my ideas. I want to get it to as close as possible. And if that means I have to take two takes and splice them together, so be it. Because years from now, I'm not going to be here. Hopefully the recording will be, and it will live on its own merits. Mm -hmm. Musical ideas, Mozart, there's a thousand ways to play it, right? We know this. And yet 
a, a great performance of Mozart. There's some magic going on there. We've all mm-hmm. been in bad concerts and we've all, <laughs> somebody said this about baseball once. It's not that baseball is a great sport, but peace, people go to baseball games because there's a possibility of greatness. You might be there at one of those moments where the most amazing things happens, which may include catching a fly ball or whatever else, or a play is just happening, or, you know, sports fans have been at games where they go, oh my God, this one thing happened. Music can be like that too. Greatness is possible. So if you can capture that, I personally, I don't care how you do it. Mm -hmm. Tricks, sure, whatever, right? I want to transfer the experience I I believe in. And, you know, in, in the weirdest sense, there's all this rigmarole, the process you have to go through between playing a piece, recording it, turning it into a recording, getting it to somebody else. But if you think about it, that's just one line. If I'm making a record, it's going to be to you. And it's just the two of us. It doesn't matter how many people are, are listening in the room. I've had, I've made this musical utterance and I want you to hear it. Mm-hmm. That's a one-to-one relationship. And that's that's pretty cool that you can sculpt that and hand that over. And it may take months to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could do it in a room. Blah, blah, blah. So Interesting. Um, I suppose with jazz, um, when there's like more in the moment interaction, I feel like that might be harder to do. But um, I mean, I guess like in my mind, I'm like, of course, he's not having anybody cheat, but it's not sports. Like, uh, so it's about beauty. It's not about competition. And mm. um, yeah. All of the above. Cool. Um, well, I feel like I, I don't need to take up too much more of your time. Um, and there's a lot to chew on here. Um, is there anything else that uh, you want to talk about before we wrap up? Uh, a thousand things. I think we, we have covered <laughs> a lot of ground, right? I mean, mm-hmm. again, who is listening to this narrow cast right is it going to be (laughs) guitarist is it composer is it music lovers there's so many different levels right Mm -hmm. um i don't you want to hear about what i'm up to or what's going to happen in the next year or so Mm -hmm. so that's i'm pretty excited actually because uh, right now uh the parch group is where's some wood i want to knock on uh we have a contract we're supposed to go to south korea and play um, a week's residence there which would be great. And when we come back, we're doing uh, two premieres at uh, Disney Hall at Red Cats Theater. It's a black box theater that's connected with Disney Hall. A um, long time ago, gosh, I, was it 10 years ago? We made this wonderful recording of Harry Parcher's Plectra and Percussion Dances, which blessedly got a Grammy nomination and won a Grammy all at the same time. Uh, Parch recorded the piece way back in the 50s, but never quite nailed it because, you know, he didn't have the players that he needed. Um, I, my band, they're the best studio players in L.A., so they're, they're really, really great. Now, Plectra and Percussion Dances is known as a dance drama. Okay. And it's in three movements. The first movement is called Castor and Pollux. The middle movement is called Ring Around the Moon. And the last is called Even the Wild Horses. Now, the first 15-minute section, uh, that's our hit song. We play it wherever we go because it's so great. And it has been choreographed by at least seven or eight different people since the 1950s, including we have commissioned two choreographies for this. But nobody has ever choreographed the entire thing. And it's supposed to be the full 50 minutes of it choreographed. Well, guess what? We we hired and commissioned a choreographer. So in June of this coming year, as in, you know, 2022, uh, we are going to give the premiere of the entire Plexer and Percussion Dances and a brand new choreography, which is just, I'm just so excited about it. I can't stand it. Also on the program is a, a brand new piece that uh, is, this is one of the interesting things when you play Harry Parch's music. It's all great music. Well, it's mostly great music. There are a couple of weird little pieces, but uh, there's only so much. Mm-hmm. Are you supposed to stop there? No, of course not. And this last year, we commissioned a bunch of new pieces, some short pieces, and we're in the midst of commissioning new music for these instruments. So there's a brand new piece coming up for String Quartet, 
and Parch instruments. It's going to be premiered in June. And the composer is a Canadian composer named Taylor Brook. I'm very excited about that. Excellent. And we've got, uh, we've just got a commitment from a, a wonderful composer. I'll, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm not allowed to talk about that quite yet, but <laughs> so point is, I mean, how fun is that? People taking and uh, again, if you if you go to the Parch website, parch.la, uh, there's access to some of the videos um, back in 2020. In the before times, mm -hmm. we had this great program that was a bunch of commissions and bam, no concert. Mm -hmm. Last year in 2021, uh, Disney Hall Red Cat asked us to come back and perform them. Great. So we we rehearsed them, got everything ready to go. And then they said, oh, sorry, we can't. The COVID compliance officer said we can't have more than like 10 people in the room at a time. It's like, what are you talking about? So we ended up videoing them and those are available, right? So we've got seven brand new people. We include, if you saw that listening to Lute Sue, mm -hmm. uh, the video, that was part of those commissions. Okay. And there's six other pieces. Yeah. So awesome. uh, it's been such a blast. And talk about challenges because nobody who goes to school now, you may study about Harry Parch, but nobody says, here's a diamond marimba. Mm -hmm. Here's a chromalodeon with 43 notes per octave. Here's how you write for it. Here's what, you know, whew, forget it. It's not how, and to be able to, to find people who are interested in doing that and climb that steep learning curve right. that allows them to be able to write the music. It's just just wild. I, I have to laugh. You know, uh, s there's been more lute music written in Western history than all the piano music put together. Hmm. Really? That's phenomenal because piano has been around since like the 1720s. No, there's thousands of pieces. And here's the joke. Do we know it's all great? Not necessarily, but the funny thing is that musicologists have had to learn lute tablature <laughs> in order to find out what the music was like, in order to write about it, et cetera, et cetera. And boy, do they bite off something because lute tablature is not standardized. It depends if it's German, if it's Italian, if it's French, it depends <laughs> what century. Mm -hmm. So these musicologists have had to bend over backwards just to get at this repertoire. That hasn't happened with Parch's music Interesting. yet. It's just started. Somebody, uh, geez, at the end of the 1990s, published an academic version of Barstow. Uh, there's four different versions of it. No, there's five, actually. And it was the last one, the most famous one. And he wrote the whole thing out. You, uh, When you read this book, it's the history of the piece. It has all the tablature. And then it has a translation into pitch using something known as Ben Johnson's pitch notation. Okay. So that's the sort of thing that's very exciting, right? All of a sudden people are saying, oh, you mean this is possible? Let's go full circle here. The piece we're about to premiere in June by Taylor Brook, the Canadian composer, he did his PhD on Harry Parcher's last piece of music, Delusion of the Fury. He knows about all these instruments. He knows how they're tuned. Mm -hmm. He knows exactly what to do with them. That's amazing. That's never yeah. happened before. And more and more people are, I mean, there's actually, is it three now? There's three. Oh, there's our set of instruments. There's the original set of instruments, which are up in the University of Washington. They're not being used right now. It's a very long story. Uh, a German group called Musikfabrik in Cologne has Cop has copies of all the instruments. It took them hundreds of thousands of, of euros to make that happen. There's a Dutch group called Scordatura who have, uh, I think they're up to eight parts instruments now. They're popping up all over all the planet. It's very cool. And what this really tells me is two things. First of all, people are interested in microtonality. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're interested in parts. Why? Same reason I am. The music is so damn good. But now that the instruments are here, what do we do with them? It's not just parts. Musique Fabrique, this huge organization, is commissioning new pieces that includes the parts instruments in chamber orchestras, in full orchestras. It's fascinating. In other words, 
the doors are opening to uh, along with the interest in world music too because we all know that you know middle eastern music uses all sorts of modes the daska the iranian classical music they're all these so-called microtones that have been around forever and now we're on the way in the west are starting to learn how to use them too that's pretty exciting mm-hmm. we're in a wonderful i think they call it an inflection point right <laughs> <laughs> where people are starting to ask questions like you're asking and getting answers and saying I want some of that. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, when I was at USC, there was a, a moment when in the art gallery at the Roski School, they had um, a bunch of Parch instruments. Were those from the Parch Ensemble, do you think? Uh, those weren't the originals, were they? Oh, no, no, that was me. I was there yeah. in, the, in the Roski. I was giving a demonstration. I've done it twice there over the last couple of decades. So, yeah, they, those were copies. Interesting. So maybe we sort of cross paths years ago <laughs> oh well, were you in the room with one of those demos i believe so <laughs> oh so that was you well that was definitely me <laughs> and in fact there's a video of it you can find it online i think you have to look at roski school and then slash parch and use my name and there's a lovely hour and a half demonstration awesome cool you are probably in the room you should <laughs> look at it and see yeah go hunt that down um <laughs> interesting cool well, um, I guess I'll, I'll be seeing you at the Red Cat in uh, a little while. Um, I'm looking forward to all these new things, all these premieres. should be awesome. Um, cool. Well, it's getting close to my bedtime here, so um, I guess I should wrap up. <laughs> um, John Schneier, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and uh, I've got a lot to chew on, a lot to research. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Stay curious. Will do. All right. Thank you. Boop.